possesses God's power. Today's sermon theme doesn't reflect this focus as obviously as we talk about a man on a mission, which both describes Jesus' work for us and also it describes what drives our lives as Christians, as, as Christ's followers. Uh, nevertheless, as we receive encouragement from God's word today, through our worship service, we will remember that it is through God's powerful word we are able to follow Christ in this way and able to share in his mission and remain committed even when it's difficult to follow our faith. So once more, it's good to be in God's house with you this morning. May God bless us as we gather together around his powerful word and let us begin our worship. Please stand. <clears throat> You'll notice throughout the first part of our worship service, we have the verses of the hymn, Speak, O Savior, I Am Listening, interspersed uh, with the various parts of the call to worship and the confession and the absolution. Uh, we'll sing those as they come up. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work.
trust in it, we realize that we have not lived according to his standards. Therefore, in humility, let us come before the Lord and confess our sins. O oh Lord, Lord, we confess to you all our sins with which we have ever offended you. We justly deserve your punishment, but we are truly sorry and sincerely repent of our sins. Be gracious and merciful to us for the sake of the suffering and death of our Savior Jesus Christ, which you proclaim to us in your word. receiving Lord's Supper today, feel free to come up when the usher gets to your aisle and directs you. If you're not receiving Lord's Supper today, feel free to stay seated and let the usher pass on to the next aisle. Come for all things are now ready. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus. 
It was given over to death for me and for your forgiveness. Now, dear friends in Christ, may this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus, and may the forgiveness that he pours out on each and every one of you in his word, strengthen you and keep you firm in the true faith to life which is everlasting. You can depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. We'll continue once more in prayer as we pray the prayer of the day. We pray, Lord God, you have prepared joys beyond understanding for those who love you. Pour into our hearts such love for you that, loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns 
with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now on the peace of sins forgiven in word and sacrament, we have the joy of listening to our Lord speak to us again this morning in his word. Our first reading this morning comes from 1 Kings chapter 17, and it contains a mission that God sent the prophet Elijah on, as well as the mission that Elijah gave to Elisha, his successor, his prophet. In both cases, these two men pursued these missions with total commitment. They were men on a mission, which is how we want to act with our God-given faith and our God-given callings, with that kind of commitment. We read, A voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? That voice being the voice of the Lord, speaking to him. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel, and anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel Meholah to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and to become his servant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We continue with today's psalm, Psalm 37, which emphasizes the important the importance of commitment to the Lord's way, uh, which means following his will as it's found in his word. Uh, when we do that, we can be sure that the Lord will establish our steps. We read this word of God together. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Hope in the Lord. Keep his way. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. The word of the Lord is in their hearts. Their feet do not slip. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them because they take refuge in him. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust, Trust in him, and he will do this. We continue next with today's second reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, it's written by the Apostle Paul. Paul was another one of those biblical figures who was very much a man on a mission who wouldn't let anything deter him from sharing the gospel message with others. But in these words, notice as we read along, where his conviction comes from, or more specifically, where it does not come from. It's a good lesson for us as we look to apply God's word to us in our sermon today. We read once more. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, 
I am speaking as a fool, because Paul didn't want to boast, but as long as there are other people around him boasting, whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews, Jews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one, the form of punishment they had where they were whipped. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open seas. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led to sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. This, too, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll continue now with our hymn of the day as we prepare our hearts to focus on God's word in our sermon. Our hymn of the day is, Take My Life and Let It Be. If you are following along in your hymnal, it's hymn 695, and we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 5. seven feet tall before, or even weighed 240 pounds of solid muscle. But that's not enough, not in pro sports. Talent alone won't get you there. Not when the competition is so stiff and the stakes are so high. So what did Giannis Attentacumpo do? He put the Milwaukee Bucks on his back. He had struggled the entire series from the free throw line, but in game six, in an opportunity to win the series. They were up 3-2. 
He went 17 of 19 from the line. Took down 14 boards, blocked five shots. I think he had a couple of steals. And on top of that, total points he put up in the game, 50. It led many analysts to call it the greatest closeout game in NBA Finals history. And it is the kind of performance we've seen before, though rarely from real famous names, names like Tom Brady or, or Michael Jordan. They're the kinds of athletes who, when they are so totally dedicated to winning, they will bend everything to that cause, so much so that failure is not an option, and that means typically they do not lose, they will win. And it all serves as a picture for us today, again, of, of our theme. That's what it looks like to be a man on a mission. You bend everything to that one cause, and you will not accept failure as an option. Well, today it serves as a picture, though still a limited one, of Jesus, as we hear about him in our sermon text. And it also serves as a picture for the mission that God has called you and me to as Christians, as Christ's followers, who therefore would share in his mission. That's what God shares with us today in our sermon text. Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 51. We listen as God speaks to us again this morning in his word. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, so this is a little bit before his death, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. It's a simple sentence, but it sets the stage. Jesus knew what awaited him in Jerusalem. Betrayal, torture, lots of pain, and then death. But still, as we see here, he went to Jerusalem with commitment and determination. He was a man on a mission, and nothing was going to stop him. Verse 52, he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. In the eyes of the Samaritans, who had a little bit different religion, Jerusalem was a, a false place of worship. Verse 54, when the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? I suppose you could say James and John, too, were men on a mission. But was it the same as Jesus' mission? I think we already know the answer to that, don't we? Jesus' love and compassion wasn't guiding them here. And indeed, verse 55, Jesus turned and he rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And without a response recorded from this man afterward, it's implied that the man didn't follow. Simply put, Jesus' mission did not align with his. Jesus' mission, as he makes clear in these words, involved leaving behind the day-to-day -day comforts of life and home, and many just don't want to do that. Verse 59, he said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And that sounds reasonable, but in the language in which this was first written, it suggests that his father was still alive. It's not that he had just died or something like that. In other words, what this man is really saying to Jesus is, I'll follow you at some point in the future, Jesus, when I've got nothing else left to attract my attention. But Jesus said to him, verse 60, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And here again, you can see Jesus' mission did not align with this man's mission. Uh, Jesus' mission involved prioritizing your relationship with him first and making all other relationships with him second. And that's hard for people to do. Verse 61. Still, another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And this 
This one sounds the most legitimate, but verse 62, Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Once more, Jesus' mission didn't align with his. Jesus' mission involved looking ahead forward to the most important things, but apparently Jesus discerned this man would always be looking back, looking back to what he had left behind, and therefore not focused. And you'll notice, when you think of it like that, it's very much unlike Elisha in our first reading, who said goodbye to his family, sure, but then what did he do? He burned the plowing equipment, he destroyed it. There was no going back. He really was committed. And that's it. This is the word of the Lord to us this morning. Let me ask you as you think about that, are we men and women on a mission? And not just any mission, mind you, but are we, are we men and women on the mission that God wants us on? If you think about what we just read, it's not just enough to have zeal. It's not just enough to feel like, oh yeah, I have a mission in life alongside my faith, alongside my following Jesus. After all, James and John, they had zeal. They had that sense of mission and purpose. But as Jesus' rebuke made it clear, they were plainly missing something. No, the real question is, are we truly committed to Christ and doing things his way? And do we share the same purposes, the same end goals as Jesus does? And the reason I ask that today is because if we take an honest inventory of the things that we are committed to, the list is not a short one. You think about my intro today, yes, I am a fan of the Milwaukee Bucks. How dedicated are you? Am I to sports teams? Or how about softball leagues? How dedicated are we to workout routines or skincare regimens? How about career fields or mowing the lawn? How about keeping up your home or your car or your boat? How about listening to your favorite podcast every day or, or streaming that favorite show online every week? <laughs> what about hobbies, hunting, fishing? What about your family? What about your kids? I mean, the list could just go on and on all day. But the question, where is Christ amidst all of that? How dedicated are we to him and, and what he says versus how dedicated are we to everything else, even if we do zealously worship God on a Sunday morning or write out a big offering check from time to time or, or come to church to go to Bible study or to participate in one of our, our volunteering opportunities. You see, the truth of the matter is you and I are men and women on a mission. It's just that sometimes, perhaps even often, we could say, it's not the mission that Christ is on. And you think about it, that's not a good thing. That is not going to end well. I mean, talent alone isn't enough for professional athletes. For them to win, they need to be men on a mission to win, with nothing else to distract them. And you think about it, if that's the way it is with professional sports, isn't it even more the case with our faith when there is so much more at stake? I mean, think about what we're up against. We're up against the devil and his forces. And we have a situation where any sin we commit will always, always put a barrier between us and a God who is perfect in, in every way. The fact of the matter is, it is this way for us. It's just that we are not fully committed to this mission to save us. We, we can't be. Our sin makes that impossible. But the good news, as we always find it in God's word, where you and I are not fully committed to that mission to be saved, to get to heaven, Jesus was. And that's what we were reminded of today in, in such a memorable way. Think about the words we heard from God's word. Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Just think about that. How committed would you have to be to something, to walk into what you know is going to be a trap? To walk into what you know will result not just in your torture, but in a long, slow, excruciatingly painful death. Jesus knew that was coming. He knew what they were saying about him. He knows all things. He's God. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that's what awaited him in Jerusalem. Or at least we should say sort of. The, the difference being that the, the physical pain that Jesus saw there would be akin to a paper cut for you and me. 
Because Jesus wasn't just going there to suffer at the hands of mankind. Terrible, though that would be. But Jesus had a greater purpose, a greater mission. He was going there to fulfill God's purposes for him. Jesus was going there to suffer hell and to suffer death for the sins of the whole world, including for your sins and for mine, including for the sins we're talking about today. That's the mission Jesus was on, and he was committed to it. He was resolute. Nothing was going to stop him. Your Savior was not going to let anything get in the way of his loving you and his forgiving you from all your sins so that he could secure a place with him in heaven for you. If it helps to think about all of this in a different way, maybe you could think of our faith as what it would be like to, to be one of those individuals riding the bench on that Giannis attempted Kumpo 2021 Milwaukee Bucks team or, or those people who rode the bench on those Tom Brady Patriot squads over the last few decades as they won six Super Bowls or, or what it would be like to be on Michael Jordan's Bulls riding the bench. You think about it, those, those guys riding the bench, those practice squad players, they don't really do anything to earn the victory. Don't get me wrong, they're a part of the team, but anybody could have taken their place, the outcome's the same. It's the superstar who carries that team to victory. That's what we have in Jesus. You think about it. He decided he would not lose. So what did Jesus do? He put the team on his back. He put you and me on his back, and he single-handedly earned that heavenly trophy for us. We did nothing to earn this victory. Yet it's all ours because of what Jesus did. It's wonderful news. Every time you sin, every time you fall short, you think, there's no way I could ever get to God. We know Jesus carried us to victory. What an incredible thing. And yet, with that being said, don't you want something more than that? And here's what I mean by that. When you are a part of something so great, when you are a part of a mission so meaningful, don't you want to contribute to it? Don't you want to be a part of that? And no, we can never earn our own way to heaven. There's no way. We're, we're little human beings. We can't get to heaven on our own. Jesus did that for us. But because we are on Jesus' team, and he inspires us as his followers, because we love him, don't we want to join him in this mission and find that same purpose that he has? And that's why, dear friends in Christ, we're not going to want to get caught looking over our shoulders, focused on all the things we could have if it weren't for our faith, all the things we could be doing if God didn't say no. If we're doing that, then we're not going to be any good to anybody. Our good works, they're not going to be good works. What we want to be doing is looking forward, focused on Jesus, listening to what he says, and then, kind of like when you're mowing your lawn and you're fixed on that one point, you're going to mow a straight line, right? Instead of looking over your shoulder and it gets all crooked. That's when we're going to produce a better product that's going to help more people. That's going to be more beneficial to our friends and our family and the, the people around us. We can show them Christ's love is working that way. Likewise, this is why we're not going to want to avoid doing the things we should be doing now, putting them off for the future. We're, we're not going to want to get too caught up in the relationships we have now, or whatever else it is, to the exclusion of our relationship with Christ. And, and don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that any of those other things are necessarily bad. Jesus never once said that today. It's just that we want to make sure that none of these things would get in the way of our relationship with Christ, would affect that. Because if we let that happen, well, when are we ever going to come around and be any good to anybody? We'll, we'll always find an excuse not to live life Christ's way. And finally, this all explains why we don't want to get too caught up in the comforts of this world either. And long for a life that's a little bit easier. And so, what do you do if that's your goal, your mission, an easy life? You're going to ignore some of the things that Jesus says. You're not going to do them because it's going to make life a little bit more difficult. But then if you follow that mission, what happens when someday everything's gone? All the comforts of this life are going to end. At some point, we're all going to die. Then what do we have if we don't have Christ? Then we find something better in him. And you think about all that. Because we are men and women on this mission, it just takes us back to what we've been talking about the last few weeks. This is why we need more of God's word in our life. Think of what we find in God's word. It plainly shows us how Jesus carries us to victory over our sinful shortcomings in this area. And not only that, but as we see how much our God loves us, it motivates us 
to join him in his mission. And as we do that, then what do we do? We put in the training, we put in the time, we, we put in that court time and those early morning gym reps and those early morning miles with God's word. And, and what do we get out of it? The more of God's word we get, the more of God's power we find to live life in this way, to follow Christ in his mission as those who have been saved by him. That's how we can be men and women on this mission. That's how we can go all in with our faith, like we heard Jesus talk about in our sermon text today. And it's kind of an interesting thought to close with. You think about that, going all in on something. Think about that in terms of poker. You go all in in poker, that is not something you do lightly. Because if you do it wrong and you lose, that's it, game over. You got nothing left. But if, on the other hand, you have a good enough hand, be worth the risk. For that matter, let's say you have a great hand, the best hand. Suddenly going all in it is transformed from being the most terrifying thing in the world you could do to being the easiest, most exciting move you can make. And you think about it, that's what God shows us today in his word. In our Savior, we don't have a gamble. There's nothing uncertain about it. We have the greatest hand there is. Jesus was a man on a mission for you and for me. And he earned a heavenly trophy for us. That's something that's worth going all in on. So what do we do when we look at Jesus, when we look at his love for us, when we see what he's done for us, the eternity he's earned for us? We totally commit ourselves to him as Christians. We bend everything to this purpose. Because we know we're not going to lose. In fact, in this case, we've already won. Amen. Absolutely. Please stand. And now may this peace of God, which passes all our human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus, a life which is everlasting. Amen. We'll continue now with our confession of faith. Today we'll use the familiar words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated, except for you kids, because it's children's sermon time, so I'll invite the kids to come up. I know there's only three of you, but I am so glad that each of the three of you are up here. That's fantastic. I was walking. You were walking up? I saw that. I was running. Yes, you shouldn't run in church, Daniel. Do you guys ever watch sports? No. Yes. Okay, yeah, so, right, maybe. And as you get older, you might watch it more. Maybe you, you see football on TV or, or hockey played somewhere. Yes? Have you you seen sports somewhere, you said, Lexi? No, no. Oh, no, you haven't? Mom and saw me play people. And you play sports, huh? In fact, that might be another thing. When you play sports, do you have a jersey like this? Yeah. Isn't that cool? So when sports players play, they wear jerseys. That, that way you know what team they're on, right? And then some people, they'll even wear jerseys of their favorite sports teams. Me, I'm a Green Bay Packers fan. I haven't watched this jersey since they won the Super Bowl, and I hope they'll win again sometime soon. But that's besides the point for you kids. Um, you'll see people, they'll wear their favorite jerseys. They might wear a hat for their favorite team, right? And do you think, do you think they do that because they're excited about their team and they want them to win and do well? And, and when your team's winning, it's exciting to wear that jersey and, and wear that hat for the, Maybe, maybe not when you're playing, but when you're watching it, if your team loses, do you think, do you, think you want to wear this stuff as much? Yeah. Maybe not. You're, you're, kind of, you're kind of sad that they lost. and Yeah, that, so that's kind of the sad part about following sports and having a team that you but, like. But the Packers won the, the we will be happy. 
Yes, if the Packers win, we will be happy, but they always find a way to lose in the playoffs, and then Daddy gets very sad, yes. And then Daddy, have you ever noticed, he'll wear this when they're playing, and then he takes it off when they lose, and it's very sad. You know, the reason I'm talking about this today... When you have the rest of the players, do you don't lose, and you just leave your hat and shirt on, and then you score? I, so you could do that too if you're playing, that's right. Now, all of what I'm talking about today, it, it's kind of like what we believe. Because when life is really good and things are going well and we're happy, are those the times where maybe we especially think about Jesus and we're thankful for the things he's given to us? And maybe we pray and we go to church and we listen to what he says and we want to tell other people about him? Is that pretty easy to do when you're happy? I think it is, right? When you're happy, you want to tell other people why you're happy. We can tell them about Jesus, right? But maybe when we're, we're sad or we're hurt and life's not going well, maybe, do we get as excited about Jesus and those things? No, but maybe not, what right? Do when you when Jesus well, and that is an excellent thing to remember, as it always is, because you know what Jesus promises? Even when life is really bad, does Jesus promise always to be with you? Yeah. yeah, so even when life is bad, we can still talk about Jesus and go to church. And we don't have jerseys for Jesus, but we can still do things that would show people we're a part of Jesus' team. And we're excited about that even on a bad day yeah. because of what Daniel said. What if, even on a bad day, even when, even when we sin or we're being hurt because of someone else's sin, what did Jesus do with that sin? He died on the cross, and he took it away, right? So because we have Jesus, because we're on his team, we're always going to win, even when we're having a bad day, and that's pretty exciting, right? Unlike our sports teams that, that lose, and then we got nothing, and we take off our jerseys, we can always be excited about Jesus, because even on the bad days, did he still die for your sins? And does he still love you? And will he still always be there for you? And will he still take you to heaven someday? That's right. Even, even when you're having a bad day, all of that's true, right? Yeah. Jesus won't fail. All right, why don't we pray about that, okay? We'll, we'll fold our hands, we'll bow our heads, and we pray. Dear Jesus, forgive us for all the times we have chosen to follow our desires instead of yours. Help us as we struggle with temptations to sin and lead us to look to you and to listen to what you say in your word. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Let's say it together. Yay. Amen. All right, thank you so much for coming up. Have a good rest of your day. Yes. Could you tell me later? All right. <laughs>
Amen. Amen. We also pray, Heavenly Father, thank you for answering the prayers of millions over the last half century and leading the Supreme Court of our nation to overturn the sinful Roe versus Wade decision that had legalized abortion throughout the country. We rejoice to know that the lives of many thousands of unborn babies will no longer be taken, and we praise you for your mercy in letting us see this long-awaited day. Still, we recognize that this is not the end of abortion or other threats to the sanctity and value of life. So we continue to pray that you would lead the legislators, officials, and judges of our states to righteous, life-affirming decisions and policies. We ask also that you would give us the courage, strength, and love we need, not only to oppose corruption in our society, but also to joyfully share the gospel of Christ with sinners who have been entrapped or injured by abortion and other evils. Lead us to support and love them just as you would. Help us to follow you in your mission to love all and to share your love with all. We pray this in your Son, Jesus' name, through your Holy Spirit. Amen. And then finally, we pray the prayer in our bulletin. O Lord, Almighty God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive my open sins and my secret sins. Forgive the sins I know and the sins I do not know. Forgive the sins I do to please myself and the sins I do to please others. Forgive them all for the sake of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear my prayer. prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, give me strength and willingness to say with your Son, not my will, but your will be done. From your hand I am willing to take the good and the bad, the joy and the sorrow. Make me cheerful and trusting to bear whatever you let happen to me. Instruct me with your word and comfort me with your gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear my prayer. Lord God, Savior Jesus, you promise to comfort those who mourn and to satisfy those who hunger. In time of trial, remind me of your cross, for you endured the curse of sin, and encourage me by the message of what you have done for me. When I am weak, teach me to depend on you for strength. At the time of your choosing, deliver me from suffering and distress. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear my Lord. prayer. Hear Lord God, Holy Spirit, too often I put my own concerns and priorities above your will and work. Rid me of my selfishness and fill me with zeal to remain committed to you. All that I have comes from you, my body and mind, my strength and intelligence, my time and abilities, my energy and possessions. Guard me from the temptation to use these gifts only for my personal benefit. Make me willing to use them joyfully in service to you and others, even when it is difficult. Lord, in your mercy, hear your mind prayer. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught us with confidence that you will hear us through the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, dear brothers and sisters in the faith, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord your God with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. And we'll close our service with our final hymn, Lord Jesus Christ, with us abide. If you're following along in the hymnal, it's hymn 641. We'll sing the first three stanzas and then stanza seven.
exciting week here, especially for the youngest ones in the room. We are doing a family movie night this week. Uh, this coming Thursday. Uh, so, we'll be watching the movie Encanto. It will have hot dogs, popcorn, other drinks and goodies provided. You already knew that because you probably saw the postcard in your bulletin. Uh, feel free to invite any friends, any family members. We're inviting our, our people who have been here with Mornings with Mommy as well in the past. So we're hoping to get a, a nice group for our, our family movie night. Then if you have any questions about that, just ask me. But uh, otherwise, Come ready to watch a movie at 6 o'clock on Thursday. Otherwise, in terms of other events happening this week, Bible study, we will be resuming our midweek Bible study this week. Details are in your bulletin. Uh, for the next four weeks, including this week, uh, we'll do a rotation between different members' homes for our midweek Bible study as we, uh, I think in a lot of cases, get outside if the weather's manageable and enjoy our, our nice summers here. Uh, the first one will be at our parsonage. You can find the address there in the bulletin if you haven't been there before. 7 o'clock, we'd love to have you. And uh, if the weather's nice and everything, maybe we'll be able to hang out afterward and enjoy a little fellowship as well. Uh, bring your own Bible uh, to that. And uh, yeah, we'll, every week we'll share details about where the next one will be at because it won't always be at the parsonage. And then uh, we have our men's Bible study on July 2nd, Saturday morning. Next Saturday morning at 8, uh, we'll continue. We just started the book of 2 Corinthians, so it's a great time to jump in. And then next Sunday, we will have Sunday School and Adult Bible Study as we continue our look at Luther's Catechism. And we will also have uh, worship at 10 as usual. And we'll continue our theme, God's Word Possesses God's Power. Other than that, the, the only other announcement I have is just for those of you who are involved in leadership in the church. If I could just meet with you briefly after the service. We have our, we'll have a bigger meeting, as I shared with you via email, on the 17th of July. But a couple of quick things that, uh, just some information I can use to you right now that, that would help me out. Other than that, anybody else have any announcements to share with the congregation? Heather? Uh, women's Bible study, we're going to do a one-day Bible study uh, Saturday, July 16th. Double check I have that date correct, but I believe it's whatever that Saturday is. It is the 16th. Very good. More details will come on that, I'm sure. Yes. And that'll be probably a longer one, right? A, yes. A few hours, a probably go brunch with it, yeah. right? Yes. So I'm getting that look because I just said more details will come. <laughs> uh, so more details will come, and I will stop offering them. Anybody else have any announcements to share with the congregation? Uh, yes. I just have a question. Is our Bible study still Hebrews, or are we starting a new one? Uh, we're starting a new one. Okay. I have not updated that yet. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to look at the book of Mark. Mark. We talked about doing one of the Gospels, so I think we'll do Mark. Unless anybody has strong feelings and really wants to do Matthew. We're avoiding Luke, because you'll notice we're in the year where a lot of our sermon texts are from Luke, so we'll, we'll do something a little bit different. Uh, anybody else? Any announcements? I love unicorns. <laughs> That's a very important announcement. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Great to worship with you today. The Lord bless you this coming week. We'll see you on the way out.